We're very happy to have uh, Tiao Shanghan, who is one of the guys of the collaboration from MIT, tell us about new algorithms for lattice uh, quantum field theory. Quantum field. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very happy to be here. All right, so we've already heard quite a bit about lattice quantum field theory, um, but let's just start with a reminder right from the start. Um, so, well, I guess this is a bit uh, QCD specific that we might discretize onto a four dimensional Euclidean space time grid, but of course, lower dimensions is also possible. Um, and essentially, we just have a numerical first principles approach to studying the theory, your field theory, in, in the um, non perturbative regime in a way that's systematically improvable, right? So, in the limit as the lattice spacing becomes small and the lattice volume becomes large, you can map to your continuum, uh, you know, infinite volume theory. And because I'm going to talk a little bit about algorithms, um, I also want to be just a little bit specific about how this is done. So once we've discretized the theory, um, we want to compute the path integral here, right? Here we have integrals over our gauge and fermion degrees of freedom. We're in Euclidean space time. So our action has no i here. So this is just the path integral weighted by the exponential of the action. And in our lattice calculation, we sample over these degrees of freedom with this exponential weighting of the action already built in. So this is an important sampling technique because basically all you have to do is an integral in something like 10 to the 12 dimensions. So trying to do that by brute force Monte Carlo would be incredibly inefficient. Um, so important sampling, sample over those 10 to the 12 dimensions with the exponential of the action built in as a weight. And then essentially computing observables becomes taking mean and standard deviations over that set of samples. Right, so, so that's the general idea. Um, and over the last, you know, it's been really the last five years that we've now entered a, a true precision era for lattice QCD. Um, and this has come at, you know, the expense of 30 years of optimization of the relevant QCD codes that we're now in an era of sub percent precision for many simple observables, where simple means observables describing the structure of the proton say, as well as mesons, spectroscopy, structure, and so on. And so we have highly optimized code bases using many millions of CPU, GPU hours, um, you know, optimized through intensive collaborations with, say, NVIDIA and Intel to run on their chips. And so this is really, um, you know, there have been specific processes designed for QCD. The forerunners of the Blue G Blue Q supercomputers came out of this effort. And so it's really the last five years that this has reached, uh, you know, this, this true era of systematic control. Um, and here is just a couple of examples. Uh, the proton neutron mass splitting has been computed in the calculation with QCD and QED, all fully dynamical. Um, here it is, proton neutron mass difference. Uh, the number ag agrees with what you can measure experimentally, of course, um, but also mass splittings between other members of baryon isospin multiplets can be computed, some more precisely than experiment here or here, somewhere where there have been no experimental measurements at all. So this is, you know, fantastic success. Predictions for new states. So this is a spectrum of, of heavy baryons with charm quarks, bottom quarks in them. The, the points are from lattice QCD. The bands are experimental measurements, except for this one, well, I photoshopped that band on afterwards, so it might not be in exactly the right place. The prediction of the state from lattice QCD um, led the LHCB experiment to look precisely there and the state was found exactly where it's predicted. So we have a predictive first principles approach uh, and it's not just spectroscopy and structure. You know, many of the basic properties of high temperature QCD have now been uh, computed. So here we have the interaction measure and the deviation from a, a free gas, if you like. And, and this peak here is sort of a manifestation of the deconfinement transition. Um, and even now dipping our toes into nuclear physics. And so I, I changed it up and added some slides, particularly because of what Sergey said before, um, <laughs> that we really are now beginning to be in an era of understanding even nuclear physics from first principles. So this is a figure from, you know, more than five years ago now, our very first study of a nuclear reaction, NP to D gamma. So, you know, in the first seconds after the Big Bang, the start of the Big Bang nuclear synthesis pathway, and this is figure is showing the low energy constant and effective field theory parameterizing the two body interactions. Um, these are points from lattice QCD, you know, extrapolation down to the physical point. This is in the pion mass squared where you're pushing the edges of what's possible computationally. 
going to heavier pion masses makes the computation easier. So for nuclear physics, we're still extrapolating down, whereas for say single hadron physics, we're computing directly at the physical point. Um, and I just added these slides for Sergey basically. Um, doing nuclear physics from first principles is incredibly hard. And to give you just a hint of the computational difficulty, um, the noise in the calculation, so the statistical uncertainty grows exponentially with the number of nucleons. That means, remember we're doing Monte Carlo, the number of samples you need to take to get the same statistical errors grows exponentially. But the number of work you need to do on each sample from contracting all of the quarks, of course, grows factorially. And so you have compounding exponential and factorial problems uh, if you want to do nuclear physics from first principles. Um, but we're doing it uh, and largely thanks to coming up with clever algorithms. Um, so I never thought I would become someone who talks about algorithms, but, but here I am. And that's really driven by these physics problems. And over the last few years, we've been able to study, you know, proton-proton fusion, tritium beta decay, scalar matrix elements that you might care about if you're interested in dark matter scattering from nuclei in a detector, double beta decay, neutrino fall and neutrino list just this year, um, EMC effects, so nuclear effects in the distribution of quarks inside nuclei directly from QCD. And we're just at the very beginnings of this road. Okay. Yeah. The, the decaying to the photon, uh, how is the photon put in just as an operator? Yeah, so, so you're basically just calculating local matrix elements or matrix elements of local operators. Between, right? between NP and deuteron. E exactly. NP, deuteron, matrix element. Yeah. Okay, so we've seen um, how lattice QCD can help confinement. This is really some slides from our presentation at the Simons Collaboration as a sort of reminder of what we set out to do. We've already talked about the confining, you know, the confining strings that we see emerging clearly in numerical studies. So this is the evolution of lattice gauge theory uh, to 2005. Um, we talked about blue balls, and we'll talk more tomorrow about blue balls and how lattice calculations can really, um, you know, give us spectra. And now with systematic control, really, with enough investment. What I, we haven't talked about yet, and I think is something that, deserves some more thought is the apparent connection between some topological features of gauge fields and, and confinement. There have been some really interesting results. This is not my work um, from other groups that connect, for example. So here is a figure from the Adelaide group um, where I did my PhD of the quark mass function in, in Landau gauge. Here there's a bare quark mass of, of 12 MeV. This is the mass function it's momentum. Uh, and the difference between these two curves is this was done in a lattice calculation. And here, the, the field configurations were distorted. Essentially, what was done is all of the gauge lengths were projected uh, and the, to the closest, well, so they went to a maximal center gauge, essentially, and then factorized the center element and the remainder, and then threw away the center element of the gauge group, essentially removing all of the dynamical mass generation. And so, you know, this is a brutalization of the gauge fields. It, it maybe hints at some connection between center vortices, dynamical chirosymmetry breaking, mass generation. There's a lot more work to be done there to understand, um, you know, what these connections are. Okay, so lattice field theory for confinement. What we really talked about was trying to systematically explore the connection between regimes of field theory where confinement is well understood and those where we don't have analytic understanding. Of course, that means going to low dimensional field theories, um, theories without matter, uh, and, and then trying to connect. And one of the problems we face is that all of these developments in the lattice QCD community have largely been for QCD in, in four dimensions. And we're now at the point where this you know, intense period of 30 years of development and optimization has, has led us to a point where those codes are now not easily adapted to other theories. And so it's, it, it is not so, so trivial to take all of those developments and, and wind them back to the other theories we might like to study. And so really capitalizing on you know, the developments in lattice gauge theory needs a bridging of communities and it needs new efforts in numerics. Um, is it to remove the fermion power? That is, that is more straightforward, yeah. Yeah, pure, pure gauge, SU3, yeah. Okay, um, so I would ask to talk about some of the new developments in AI and machine learning. So AI and machine learning sometimes gets a lot of puzzled looks in the theoretical physics community. Um, so 
I want to talk about how we can get exact results using AI and machine learning. And there's certainly places where inexact results and intuition can be useful. But let's talk about cases like lattice field theory, where you're interested in mathematical guarantees of exactness. In this case, because you want to use machine learning to accelerate your calculation, but you still want to know that you're studying a field theory um, in, in all of the right limits. So the only place you have here for machine learning then is, is this. You, you need to formulate your problem in such a way, create a scenario where having badly trained machine learning algorithms means that your answers are still correct, but they're slow. And where having well-trained machine learning algorithms means you get the same answers, but faster. And, and, and there's really, you know, th that is it. And really, this is more a, a question of problem formulation and understanding what the machine learning is than anything else. So th there's no room for, you know, black box, let's take a neural network and train it for something. It really is designing how you formulate the question and where you put machine learning into the workflow so that you preserve this. Right. So there's lots of different ways you could think about doing this. Um, the, the sort of simplest, which feels like you're not really doing much at all, is try to do the calculation exactly the same way, but faster. Um, maybe by using machine learning or AI to tune the parameters of some existing algorithm. And this feels like you're maybe not doing a lot at all, but there's been a lot of work in, in say, Bayesian optimization approaches, which fall under the machine learning toolkit, um, which are very valuable in this sense. So if you're interested in inverting very large matrices, you might look at using algebraic multigrid type algorithms. They have a lot of free parameters. Uh, it's a bit of a black art to tuning them. Machine learning can help, right? So on our track, if you're doing first principles theory, we're always going from the same start to the same end, right? Doing an integral, it always has the same answer, um, but maybe you get there faster with AI, right? And so this is how I would draw a cartoon or do the calculation the same way, but faster. But there are other very interesting um, opportunities. So one is to transform the problem into a different problem with better properties uh, that has the same solution. And so we know this in many different guises, right? Preconditioning, you know, preconditioning, say a matrix inversion um, is one way. And so you can use machine learning to optimize a, a preconditioner for a matrix inversion and you'll still have exact results because you'll do the inversion, you'll just have a simpler system to try to invert. And, and this is true for you know, many other uh, frameworks. A, a really nice one is change of variables or mapping between theories. You know, we've had actually fantastic success with deformations of path integrals, where of course you can deform the integral wherever you like in, in complex, but as long as you don't cross a pole, you'll get the same answer, right? But you can actually, uh, create such deformations that you either completely eliminate or avoid some sign problems. Um, and, and especially where you're not completely removing a sign problem, but just mitigating it, that's not necessarily something easy to write down analytically, right? It's because you're not transforming to a sign problem free theory. You're just deforming to remove enough of the sign problem that it now becomes computationally tractable, right? Uh, and so these are the types of things where as long as you design the machine learning algorithm appropriately, in this case, you have to guarantee that all you're doing is deforming a path into and not crossing a pole, and that has to be built into the structure of your you know, algorithm that you optimize, you, you have possibilities for, for greatly accelerating calculations. Um, another example of this, yeah. The previous point, can you, can you give us some kind of a baby version of what you mean here by deforming the contour? In the context of QCD and Fermi, in the context of QCD, uh, easy uh, deform the path integral, right? So it's essentially transform all of the gauge fields in such a way that you are you are just deforming the integration contour. And so in the in the context of lattice QCD, you, you could have your sample of your gauge fields. You can transform every single one via a map. And as long as you've constrained that map in the right way, you'll still get the same answers for observables. You might just have less statistical fluctuations. But you can even think about it just in terms of a contour integral, right? It, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So you're saying you're updating the, the, the lattice configurations in a different way from the way it's normally done. I mean, normally you do it using some local algorithm like a heat path or a metropolis algorithm, but you're, you're doing something in addition to that. 
yeah, you, you, you have options. You, you can either sample them in a different way. And actually, my next example will be all about sampling. Um, so you can sample them uh, essentially with an observable specific weight rather than just the exponential of the action. Essentially, you can weight them in such a way that you guarantee the same expectation value, but uh, not the same variance. But you have to know somehow that the, the result will converge to the same thing that you would get if you used Metropolis or Decal, right? Uh, you, you guarantee that by the structure of the deformation. Okay. So that, that is built in even before you do any optimization, you always have the right answer. Just badly optimized, you'll have an even bigger variance than your naive approach, but well optimized, you have a smaller variance, but you always have the same. Um, and, and if you'll be patient with me a little bit yeah. more, longer, uh, what about detailed balance? Yeah, so in for this contour deformation, yeah. um, that is something you can do post facto. So we're no longer talking about in the sampling step. But the next example I'll give you is all about sampling. And there we'll talk about why you don't need to worry about detailed balance. Then yeah. the analog with the contour deformation, is it like complexifying somehow the, uh, when you do the integrals say, over H links, do you make them complex or, or are you still? Yeah, I mean, you, you have choices in, in the formulation of the theory, but you, you can think of it exactly like that. You can think about it as just a complex integral that you're deforming. Yeah. yeah. And then you just know rigorously that you have to get the same method. Exactly. Un unless you cross a pole, which you want to make sure you don't do. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. So, so uh, another example, and he will get to sampling, um, is to solve a different problem and apply a known correction, right? So my, my cartoon of that is like this. Um, and so one example of this would be to map from one observable to actually a different observable than the one you wanted to calculate uh, and then apply a bias correction step. But you need to be able to prove mathematically that that bias correction will in fact uh, return you to your original observable. Um, an example that I'll go into in some detail is if you're trying to sample from a probability distribution, sample from a different probability distribution nearby and reweight. Um, and again, you, you can make that rigorous. So I think, um, I think there's lots of potential for these sorts of exact ways to use machine learning. And I sort of decided that it's, it's more useful for generating conversation that's sort of the work of this collaboration to actually go into some detail into an example rather than just saying it can be done, right? So I, I've picked one. Um, and, and the one that I've picked is to do with flow models which in this case we can think of as just being machine learned maps between probability distributions. So here's a probability distribution over Z and here's a different probability distribution. And the flow model is just a change of variables, right? So what makes it a flow model as opposed to any other change of variables is that we want this map to be invertible and have a tractable Jacobian. It needs to be a one-to-one -one map. Um, and it also needs to have very many free parameters that we can optimize, and that's the machine learning part or the, the training part, right? Is that we define this one-to-one -one map with lots of free parameters, and then we optimize it to some task, right? Okay, so one such task, um, and we'll talk about some others, would, would be to generate gauge field configuration. So the first step of any lattice field theory calculation is that we need to sample field configurations here according to the known probability distribution given by the exponential of the action. Right? And let's just visualize that, that this is just for a scalar field theory. These are actual scalar field theory field configurations, but we can just visualize them here as a real number at each site. It means we want to generate these configurations, which have you know, higher probabilities, much more frequently than this random noise configuration, which has lower. So immediately you see a few things. Um, first, you see this looks a lot like a problem that, that has received a lot of attention in the machine learning community, image generation, especially for scalar field theories. It, it looks a lot like that. And secondly, you see that there's structure here, right? These likely configurations have correlations on this sort of canonical scale, right? And, and so we need to be thinking about how that physics comes in. Obviously, we have traditional approaches for generating field configurations that's typically done by a Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo, which is essentially integrating, you know, injecting random momenta and then integrating the Hamiltonian uh, dynamics trajectories. So you update from one configuration to the next to the next uh, in this way that, that samples from different level sets in your probability distribution. Um, the problem with that is that you have a, a correlation length, right, because you're taking small updates from one sample to the next to the next. Um, and, and this was already addressed earlier today, 
uh, you have a particular problem when you want to go to fine lattice spacings that those updates are close to local or diffusive, if you like. And so if you need to decorrelate your samples on some physical scale corresponding to the size of a proton, if you want to study the proton, as you take the lattice spacing finer, you need more and more and more updates to decorrelate physics on that scale. And that diverges, and this is a manifestation of critical slowing down, and it's a, a great problem. Okay, so I think very obviously there's a nice application of flow models here. I mean, if we had flow models acting as an, as an approximation of the trivializing map that maps between a trivial base distribution and the distribution we, we care about, which is the exponential of the action here, then you have no sampling problem, right? Just quite trivially. For a scalar field theory, think sampling from a Gaussian at each site on the lattice, completely uncorrelated, right? You just take your completely independent samples, you put them through your map, and you have independent samples of the probability distribution you, you want to sample from. If we want to treat this as a machine learning problem, you have to optimize that map somehow, right? And, and typically, uh, we don't have a lot of samples of our target distribution lying around, otherwise we wouldn't be trying to generate them. So you have to optimize them without training data, right? If you think about machine learning, often you think about training data. Not necessarily the case, right? We're just talking about, in this case, a map with a lot of free parameters. And you can optimize, for example, with this loss function, this is the function we're optimizing. And this can be anything you like, as long as it has a minimum at the probability distribution you're looking for. So for example, you can estimate this loss function stochastically by drawing samples, completely independent samples saying, with what probability did I draw this sample? And well, with what probability should I have drawn this sample and minimize the difference? So you don't need any data, right? You can just self-train this. Um, and then, of course, it will never be exact, but we're trying to do exact physics here. Because this map is one-to-one, -one, you're guaranteed to sample everywhere at, at some point. And so you can either reweight your samples or form a you know, Markov chain of your completely independent samples with a Metropolis Hastings except reject step, and you have all of the usual guarantees that you have with, say, HMC. So this would be one example um, of these sorts of flow models acting as, as trivializing maps. Um, and proof of principle applications to simple lattice field theories um, reveal a lot of potential, uh, potential advantages of this approach. So a mitigation of critical slowing down and topological freezing. And as I promised, I'll go a little bit into detail so you can see how these sorts of things work. And so we'll see this. Um, very efficient parameter space exploration. So the you know, big task of I need to look at lots of different volumes, lots of different values of the quark masses and so on becomes a lot more efficient because you can take one trained model and just slightly tweak it. Um, Direct access to the partition function, which you don't get um, from HMC and, and, and so on. And so this is a, a fantastic potential application, but it's only one of, 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 of many. Um, if you're thinking about sampling, uh, of course, you, you can think about hybrid sampling approaches. You can intersperse these sorts of updates with HMC updates. You can think about mapping from one set of parameters to another. Remember, we're just mapping between probability distributions. You can think about mapping from a theory with open boundary conditions to one with periodic boundary conditions. You can map between staggered and domain wall. You can map between heavy quark masses and light quark masses and so on, right? Um, I already mentioned contour deformation uh, and density of state approaches to the sign problem. Uh, essentially, you can take similar architectures and, 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 and try to map to observable specific deformations of, of your gauge fields that minimize the variance. Um, so, if you can get these sorts of flow architectures designed for you know, gauge fields, um, they have many potential applications. And the big you know, fundamental problem here is, is you have to do the engineering work. You have to engineer flow model architectures that effectively parameterize transformation to the lattice gauge fields. That means you have to write down diffeomorphisms on lattice field degrees of freedom um, that have you know, encode symmetries, gauge symmetry, translation symmetry, and, and so on. And they have to be very flexible and expressive so you can optimize them to map between whatever pair of distributions you're interested in looking at. And so you certainly can't take, you know, some machine learning algorithm off the shelf. You have to design this from the ground up and it's really just maths, right? Except you let all the parameters be free and then optimize them at the end. Um, okay, so I'm going to, lead you through this. This is sort of one example of machine learning and 
uh, applied to lattice field theory. And I'm sort of going to lead you through the various steps here. And even if you're not interested in, say, sampling problems, I think there's a lot of lessons here that can be applied to, to other situations, especially on the, you know, designing machine learning algorithms for theoretical physics in these provably exact ways. There's sort of a lot of little pieces along the way that might tweak something that we can talk about later. Okay. So this is really something we've built up over the last few years. And let me start with an example application to scalar field theory because it's easy to understand. So here we want to transform again from a base distribution. So for scalar field theory, a real number at each site of a 2D lattice it looks like an image, right? To our target distribution, which is given by the exponential of the action, right? So we can write down a map here with lots of free parameters as a composition of many simpler layers, right? Composition of many simpler transformations. And we can get this feature that this is one-to-one -one with a tractable Jacobian and invertible in, for example, this way, where we split the degrees of freedom. So for example, a checkerboard, so the green degrees of freedom go one way, the black go another way. So in one of these layers, we just leave the green degrees of freedom alone right? But the black degrees of freedom get updated like this. So the green degrees of freedom are here. They just stay the same through the transformation. The black degrees of freedom get updated through a scaling and a translation. And those scaling and translation, S here and T, can be any function you like conditioned on the green degrees of freedom that didn't get touched. So what this variable partitioning gives you is an upper or lower triangular Jacobian. And so no matter what these functions are, S and T, um, those can be arbitrary neural networks, they can be whatever you like. This thing is invertible and has a tractable Jacobian. And so you can put all sorts of free parameters in there, stack all of these layers together, you know, transform first one half conditioned on the other, then vice versa, to get a, a very complicated map that you can then optimize in this way for sampling. Um, and in, in fact, it works. Um, so here's an example back from 2019, where we first did this, uh, demonstrating accelerated sampling of these scalar field configurations. And so what you see here on the horizontal axis is changing the, the lattice extent, so the size of the configurations. On the vertical axis is the integrated autocorrelation time or a measure of sampling cost, if you like. Here we see hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, local metropolis, so another standard updating algorithm. And you can see the, the sampling cost diverges exponentially moving from left to right in both of those cases. Um, for the flow-based sampling, it's flat moving from left to right. And that shouldn't be surprising. That is by construction, right? That if you've trained your model to some fixed acceptance rate, the only place correlations come in is from when you, you know, take your independent samples, put them into a Markov chain and do accept reject. And so if you've trained them to the same acceptance rate, they'll have the same autocorrelation time. So this has to be flat by construction. So you've traded um, sampling cost for the upfront training cost which may or may not be a good trade, depending on what you want to do. Um, and so, yeah. So you basically have a bipartite lattice and you take turns, you update first site A and then site B. Kind of. Yeah, layer by layer. So mm -hmm. sites A conditioned on sites B, sites B conditioned on sites A, and you stack lots of these transformations together. Um, but there's lots of other things you can do, actually. That's just the simplest example to understand. And you're saying this is not just... You know, model C, it doesn't have a critical exponent C in the model C universality class. I mean, local updating. I mean, there's no updates. There are no updates. There's no updates. You're taking completely independent samples. So sort of by construction, no. Um, there, there can be slowing that, you know, training can get harder approaching some limit and getting to the same model quality can get harder, but you won't see a slowdown in sampling. So it's, it's the trade-off between how well you can design them out um, and how many samples you need and, and whether this is worth doing. So the example on scalar field theory is easy to understand. Um, gauge field theories get much more interesting. Um, so the very first thing you have to do is, well, think about doing machine learning on compact connected manifolds, which is not usually where machine learning is done. Usually machine learning is done acting on the real line, but we have gauge degrees of freedom. Um, so we actually had to go back first and think about circles. How do you design transformations on circles and, and, and use them in machine learning frameworks? Um, I, I mean, really, this is just becomes, 
you know, a sort of math slash computer science problem. I won't go through in details with the circle, but you just need a diffeomorphism on the circle. So you can do all sorts of things. You can project to the real line and back, but then you've got to be really careful about the endpoints. Um, you've got to sort of tailor expand near the endpoints up so you get you don't get numerical instabilities. Um, you can do circular splines. You can do you know, projections through the circle where you expand some fraction of the circle and contract the rest, right? There's lots of options. Um, but then much more interestingly, you have to encode the, the symmetries of, of your distribution. And depending on what you want to use these maps for, that may either be essential or not. So if you want to use these maps for um, contour deformation, you must encode the symmetries. If you want to use these maps for sampling, not necessarily, as long as the map is one-to-one, -one, your accept, reject step or your reweighting will fix it. So this may or may not be essential for correctness. It is always essential for this to be practical because we're talking about a 10 to the 12th dimensional probability distribution with a large uh, symmetry group. And if you don't encode that, you are essentially trying to mock up this flat direction and wasting a lot of your expressivity trying to mock that up rather than just having it built in from the start. Okay, so how can you write down Sorry, a- when you say symmetry, you mean the gauge symmetry of the problem, right? Gauge symmetry, also translations, rotations. Um, but the bulk of it is the gauge. The bulk of it's the gauge symmetry. Yeah, so how can you write down a flow transformation that is equivariant under gauge transformations is, is a question. So why equivariant? So you could say, let's gauge fix everything then we don't have to worry about this. Then you would have to write down a transformation that stays in that gauge fixed space, which is actually fairly complicated. And you'd have to make sure that you stay gauge fixed at every intermediate layer. And you know, the easy ways of gauge fixing break your translational symmetry. So that then makes this more complicated. Otherwise you can do iterative versions of gauge fixing, but then you have to do that sort of continuously. So Another thing to do is just write down an architecture that's equivariant to gauge transformations from the start. So that means a gauge transformation in the input will give you a gauge transformation in the output. The gauge transformation commutes through the map. Um, to do that, we want to define each of these coupling layers. So remember the whole transformation is a composition of these. This is a map from, this is our, our gauge variable, the number of dimensions times the volume, right? A map from that to that. And we want to do the same thing, um, act on a subset of the variables. So update just a subset of the gauge links conditioned on the others that are frozen in a way such that gauge transformations commute through. So one simple way of doing this, and again, there's, there's many, and we're just gonna talk through the simplest, is to these are the updated links conditioned on these. We're going to update these links via what we're going to call a kernel. Um, and that kernel, H, will essentially act on, we're going to compose that link into an object which is gauge invariant under left and right multiplication by the same group element, conditioned on a gauge invariant objects constructed from these, these frozen parts, um, and then uncomposed. I have a diagram. I know that equation is a bit um, opaque. So here we go. We want to update this gauge link here. Very simplest thing we can do is multiply the links together into an untraced plaquette, which now has a much simpler gauge transformation, left and right multiplication by the same group element and it's, and it's conjugate, right? We're going to transform this untraced plaquette element for a U1 gauge theory, that's just a variable on a circle, so we can just visualize it like this, transform the distribution on the circle to a different distribution on the circle, where that transformation is conditioned on some gauge invariant things. So I say these, these plaquettes, these Wilson loops, for example. And so for a, um, a, a, a Belian field theory, that's all there is to it, right? Any transformation is then gauge equivariant. Any kernel is then gauge equivariant. And so you then transform everything. Like, so this was the link that we transformed via this plaquette. We can transform these entire stripes of links in the first coupling layer, and the next one will transform the next stripes of links and so on. And you stack those layers until you've transformed everything multiple times, um, and that gives you a, a complete transformation. It gets a bit harder when you talk about non-abelian theories, and so this is where things really get fun. Um, so here, you can do the same thing, really. So 
This diagram, the gray parts, is what I described before. That we take this link, we compose it into an untraced plaquette, we transform it, and then we, we go back. In the middle, though, is what happens for um, non-abelian field theories, where what you can really show is that the, you can prove um, that the most general transformation basically needs to transform an n-tuple of eigenvalues in a permutation equivariant way while leaving the eigenvector structure intact. And so that's essentially what you need to do. You need to do an eigen decomposition of these untraced plaquettes, um, permute everything into a canonical permutation, to a canonical cell, transform in that canonical cell, unpermute, uh, you know, un undiagonalized, recover the eigenvalues, do an eigen recomposition, and put it all back together again. And so this is, uh, I think, sort of a nice example of how complex these, these algorithms can now get, that this is actually something tractable. The, a few years, this was not a tractable proposition for me to say that we're going to take, you know, this 10 to the 12 degree of freedom object we're going to do eigen decompositions <laughs> throughout this entire structure. We're going to transform things in permutation equivariant ways, do eigen recomposition, put it all back together. Um, that just wasn't something computationally feasible, but now it is. And that's now the point we're at, at machine, in, in the machine learning world, that you can write down this absurdly complex transformation, which has lots of free parameters and all the symmetry properties you like, but has this you know, wildly complicated description um, and actually implement it. So let me show you just a couple of examples. So U1 field theory, again, very easy to understand. You know, our action, just a coupling and our plaquettes, so a, a number on the circle on each side. You can just choose the prior to be uniform numbers on the circle, you know, easy. You can put these gauge equivariant coupling layers together. Um, the kernels here can be whatever you like, say mixtures of non-compact projections, uh, where you can take the parameters of those non-compact projections as the output of complicated neural networks. Again, that can be as complicated as you like, lots of free parameters. It will still be invertible, um, still be one-to-one. -one. You optimize it, and then you can use it for sampling. And, and that's what we see here. So doing this, you actually get um, much more efficient sampling than you do through hybrid Monte Carlo. This is the topological charge. So if you like the winding number of the gauge field, so approximately quantized from the ITS index theorem. This is the Markov chain step. This is hybrid Monte Carlo. This is heat bath. You can say it's that essentially you're stuck in fixed topological sectors. Topological barriers get too high and because they're updating algorithms, you just don't transition between sectors very often at all. Whereas the flow-based algorithm, because it's not update-based, is sampling extremely efficiently. Um, and if we look at the autocorrelation time as a measure of cost, you can see moving from left to right, coupling increases, lattice spacing gets finer. Um, the cost of conventional algorithms grows exponentially. The cost of the flow-based sampling grows only a little bit. That's because training gets harder over there. Um, and this is actually a fair comparison. The cost of one update here is similar to the cost of one update here. So it's orders of magnitude more efficient. Okay, um, theories with fermions. So, at heart, fermions don't cause you any complications, right? You just integrate them out and, and then you can do exactly what you did before. And, and so flows with exact determinant evaluation. So just integrate out the fermions. You get a fermion determinant that just changes the action. No, no problem, um, work. And so you can just apply what I talked about before to the Schwinger model um, here at near critical parameters. So that this is something that's very hard for HMC. Here you see the chiral condensate as a function of the number of configurations you're sampling from. Um, the, the red and the gray are using HMC. And you can see that you need to go to very, very, very high numbers of samples with HMC before you start seeing the right result because essentially you're stuck in topological sectors. Um, and so eventually you, you do transition enough to get the, the right result, but when you go near criticality, that's, that's really hard, whereas the flow-based sampling just converges to the right result from the start. So this is uh, two massive flavors. Uh... Yeah, that's right. Okay, um, getting a scalable approach, so I don't have a lot of time, um, gets more complicated because you want to use pseudo fermions, which we've also talked about today. Um, essentially, you can do this in many different ways, but for example, by designing joint architectures that treat the, the marginal and the conditional parts of the distribution. So here's the gauge part of the distribution. Here's the pseudo-fermion part of the distribution with separate 
architectures. For the gauge part of the distribution, you can use exactly the same architectures that we talked about before. And then you can sample pseudofermion configurations conditioned on the gauge field parts of the configuration. And you can write down, you know, you have to write down new uh, pseudofermion architectures for that, which I'll skip through a little bit. Um, I'll sort of give you a, a hint that essentially all you want to do um, for pseudofermions is you want to map an uncorrelated Gaussian to a correlated Gaussian because the distribution you're trying to sample from is just a correlated Gaussian, except the normalization is very difficult to compute. So we don't want to try computing it. We want to try to approximate it. And so this is really, in some sense, a straightforward map to learn. Um, we're going to try doing the same thing, split the degrees of freedom. We'll take the frozen degrees of freedom and we will parallel transport neighboring links to the center so that we have gauge equivariant linear combinations. Again, put some coefficients on that are learnable. Those are your free parameters. You can iterate this and call that a parallel transport convolutional neural network. So again, uh, a sort of new architecture design. You then update the active gauge links um, by transformations from this gauge invariant neural network. And you have a, a transformation that you can optimize. And so just earlier, earlier this year, we put this all together and actually uh, did it for QCD for the first time. So in four dimensions, um, SU3, um, this is an illustration of fairly straightforward parameters, um, but let me just show you here. You, know, you, can, you can compare at these straightforward parameters, HMC works well. You can check that, of course, it's mathematically guaranteed to be right, but you can check and convince yourself of very high statistics that you get the right distributions of plaquette, topological charge, correlation functions, masses, and, and, and so on. Okay, so where are we at then? Um, Basically, all of the fundamental components are in place to do this for QCD. Uh, it, it requires scaling and optimization to the scale of state-of-the-art calculations. So this is sort of a, a massive engineering task. How do you really write down these models in a truly model parallel way on it for exascale computers? Um, so we have an Aurora Early Science Project. This will be one of the new exascale computers to be built in the US. And so we should get early science time on that early next year to try to run these models for QCD. And we have a team of engineers at Google DeepMind who are helping try to make this, this scaling a reality. Um, so this is just a reminder of not just sampling, but lots of different ways of using these approaches. And then let me come back to sort of the whole point that this was really just one example. And we got into the weeds because I think it's helpful to, to be in weeds when you then want to go and, and, and talk about things. Um, but there are lots and lots of different ways. Now that AI has, has really advanced to this point where you can write down almost arbitrarily complex things and actually optimize them efficiently. There, there are many useful ways of using AI to accelerate first principles theoretical physics calculations. Um, and of this particular effort, some of the things that I'm hoping will come out that might be of interest to this group are general code bases, enabling efficient study of non-QCD theories, um, very efficient parameter space exploration, large N. Actually, we've gone past N equals 500. This has turned out to be a very nice sampling approach for large N theories. Um, variance reduction for global observables is the type of thing you can get with these contour deformation approaches um, and, and so on. I hope there'll be other ideas to add to this list. Thank you. What well, a great talk. Uh, can you give us some um, numerical estimate of how much better you could do in one year or five years? I mean, some idea of you know, how, how powerful is this going to become? Hard to answer because it depends on the problem and it depends on how well we can get these things to run at exascale. You know, it's it's at the moment, it's not even clear we can make these things run at exascale, right? We're, we're talking about the same size machine learning models that have so far only been used in industry applications for say natural language processing or for AlphaGo Zero. And we're talking about trying to optimize something of the same size for an open science application. So this is why we have this tight collaboration with DeepMind, but we need to see if that can even be done to this level of optimization. Um, for the toy theories, we've got a few orders of magnitude, which is already useful for toy theories, especially if we're interested in toy theories, which we might be. Um, so right now, possibly a few orders of magnitude on theories at not too large a scale. When we start talking about actually needing to have these models 
fully optimized for exascale hardware. I'm hoping orders of magnitude, but the answer may be nothing if we can't do it. It's an engineering problem. Yeah, so it's more on the early part of the talk where you showed how it agrees with experiment. There's one number that many of us would like to know, which is this metric element that controls the muon dipole moment with the big controversy. Are you going to shed any light on that? <coughs> Uh, did you say the muon EDM? Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. So there's one number there that they still. Yeah. So the, there's, I mean, there's a couple of groups calculating, you know, all of the relevant dimension five operators that, that you might want to write down, right? Um, it it's hard. They it so it, it it turns out there seem to be larger lattice spacing dependence than one might naively expect for that particular operator. Um, so you need to get down to final lattice spacing to get true systematic control. But I, I think I think things exist already at fifteen percent uncertainties um, now. Well, the last I heard, there's still a discrepancy between the lattice and other methods, and there's also the measurements. And it's very interesting to know what the right answer is. So I'm oh, asking wait, wait, wait. whether I... you're going to do any better. Wait, sorry, I thought you were talking about the neutron electric dipole moment. Are you talking about no. G minus two of G the muon? G oh, G minus two of the muon. Oh, yeah. right. Um, yeah. So I mean the BMW collaboration had that result that is, you know, very precise. And so right now there's three or four other collaborations trying to mimic that precision. The latest is that there are some observables that are slightly easier to get at that level of precision, which are sort of window observables where you mask out the the the, the windows that are particularly difficult to control. So this is then not a physical quantity, but one that lets you compare between different lattice collaborations earlier than having the full. And they seem to agree with the BMW calculation so far, but as essentially it's going to need a few more years before the US groups have the computing. It's just a matter of computing investment to confirm that result from the BMW group. But so far the intermediate checks um, seem to agree. That's in the last couple of months, there've been a couple of papers yeah. yeah, you mentioned you know, minimizing the sign problem. From, uh, how about real time problems? Uh, you know, if you want to look at the order correlation functions, for instance, uh, is, is this something that would uh, speed up significantly? I mean, there's this issue of analytic continuation. That, uh, yeah, I mean, not this. Um, there's lots of other interesting things you can do about trying to get at real-time dynamics. Um, I mean, most of them end up going back to the Hamiltonian formulation, of course, but, but there are some really neat ways of trying to use both machine learning and then something I've been working on lately is trying to match between Euclidean and Hamiltonian formulations and how, how you really could match things like interpolating operators using classical lattice calculations between the two to, to, to try to um, accelerate but not, not what I was talking about before, but there's lots of cool things there we can talk about after. So I would like to ask a question, which is similar to what uh, David asked. Um, so um, what are the, like, the limitations in terms of like memory and uh, I mean, and how these issues would be, you think that would be resolved? I mean, in the future, and the reason I am asking, I mean, I'm mostly interested in the larger, in larger gauge theories, but I mean, I understand that machine learning is like very promising, but uh, I mean, if, if this is something that it won't happen in the next like two or three years, maybe, uh, maybe it's worth, I mean, focusing on also other, other algorithms that uh, are, let's say, more efficient than, uh, than feedback, like for instance, uh, uh, parallel centering. Yeah, so I mean, memory is not too much of a problem. Um, the problem with scaling up is really, it, it's the training. That's the scaling up training in such a way that you truly have your model parallelized over many GPUs on many different nodes efficiently um, is, is hard. I mean, you have to really think about designing the algorithm, not just what's best for the physics. I mean, so far we've been thinking about how do we encode correlation to the right scale efficiently? How do we make this look like the trivializing maps we know should this should be approximations of? But you also have to think about communications overheads and you might sacrifice a little bit of the model architecture that you'd really like for something that will run more efficiently on your cluster. Um, and so it's the training where the challenge will be that 
running the model itself is it's they're actually not that large. It's very efficient. It's the optimization process that you know we, we need to see. Can we even optimize a model so large uh, to such a high precision? That's that's the question still. Hate to interrupt this amazing discussion, but uh, uh, we I hope we can continue over the break. Let's take a fifteen minute break. And